While shopping with holistic health coach Carla Salinari, we learned that we can replace meat in our dishes with mushrooms and tofu. When seasoning our food, we also have a chance to enhance the health benefits by incorporating herbs and spices. We have amazing spices available to us and sometimes we often forget about them, right? Like turmeric and black pepper and cumin and coriander and fennel, which are such powerful aids for our digestive system and our overall health. When I chop cilantro, I remember my mom. Absolutely. It brings us back to our culture. It connects us to our roots. It allows us to put cultural dishes on the table. Things like parsley, cilantro, dill, scallions, right? So in, in addition to all the spices that we were talking about before, you can also add herbs as a way to boost not only the flavors of your meals, but also the health properties. For example, cilantro is incredibly anti-inflammatory, as is parsley and dill. And when we combine different ingredients, we not only increase the variety of nutrients on our plate, but sometimes we might also be boosting our ability to absorb more nutrients. For example, the iron in, in plants is better absorbed when you include a, a source of vitamin C. She says adding peppers, which have vitamin C, to beans improves the absorption of iron from these legumes. Plants have some chemicals that will uh, prevent some absorption of, of the, uh, some minerals like iron and calcium, but fortunately with some kind of a process, the uh, processing of your food, like for example, when you um, sprout uh, your beans, when you cook them, you will be able to eliminate some of those compounds from the plants and be able to absorb these nutrients. Those cooking processes, she says, provide health unlike the methods in which meats are processed to make cold cuts, ham, sausage and bacon. In 2015, the World Health Organization classified these processed meats as type 1 carcinogens, the same group cigarettes are in. The study says they were classified as carcinogenic based on sufficient evidence in humans that the consumption of processed meat causes colorectal cancer. When I finished my training. To understand why what we eat can cause cancer, we turn to Dr. Vanessa Mendez, a gastroenterologist and specialist in lifestyle medicine. She's so passionate about the subject that she gave us an interview while she was awaiting the birth of her youngest daughter. The microbiome is the hottest topic in health. We have anywhere between 39 and 100 trillion microbes in our gut. Uh, and these are composed of all sorts of different microbes, including viruses, bacteria, fungi. It turns out that our body is made up of human cells and microorganisms. Many of these microorganisms live in our intestine in a colony of sorts called microbiota. What is astounding about this microbiome is that we are just cracking at the surface of everything that they do in our bodies for us. Um, so they live in symbiosis with us. That means that we are, we benefit mutually from each other. So we host them in our body. So we give them a home, but we also give them food. So what we eat, they eat as well. And in turn, they turn around and provide us with a whole host of functions in the body. And the list grows every year. And the list includes anywhere from uh, metabolic, endocrine regulation, fat deposition. Um, they help protect um, our, they're, they're part of the first line of defense um, against pathogens. Um, so for example, since they live in our colon, they secrete mucus that helps reinforce the colon wall. And the colon wall, if it's not reinforced, it allows pathogens to come in and toxins to come in into our body. And why is this so important now more than ever? because 70% of our immune system is in our gut. She explains that the beneficial microbes need us to feed them fiber to perform essential functions in our body. What people don't understand is that when we consume fiber, most of it goes undigested by our entire digestive system until it reaches the colon. And that is the food for the microbes. They take it, they start breaking it down, fermenting it, and in turn, they create these byproducts that one of them um, is really a gold mine are called short chain fatty acids. Why is fiber so important? We have five pounds of bacteria in our gut that depend on fiber for their nourishment and they pay rent. And the rent they pay 
is in the form of short chain fatty acids and other nutrients that really protect our colon cells from cancer and that get absorbed into our bloodstream and do all kinds of beneficial things. No animal has fiber. No meat has fiber. No cheese or milk has fiber. So we depend on plants to give us that kind of nourishment to those five pounds of bacteria. And according to gastroenterologist Dr. Vanessa Mendez, while our bodies produce the enzymes to digest animal products, too much can create inflammation in our body, and the same goes for processed foods. Processed foods, um, you know, that's what mostly what the Western uh, diet is made of. Um, it's very high in fat, very high in refined sugar, um, and it's very high in chemicals. So the interesting part from, for me as a digestive disease specialist is that there's a lot of chemicals in processed foods such as artificial sweeteners, emulsifiers, um, that actually act on the gut microbiome and change it to a pro-inflammatory gut microbiome, just like animal protein does. She says this explains why those of us diagnosed with autoimmune disorders usually have digestive problems. 70% of our immune system is right there in the, in the gut, waiting, waiting to attack. If it attacks incorrectly, it uh, attacks out of proportion, then that's when autoimmunity, chronic disease, and inflammation result. Uh, result. Um, we want it to, we want our immune system to function not too much and not too little um, because either way, either extreme results in disease. She says to have a balanced gut microbiome, we should fill our plates with plant-based foods. We definitely should have a plant-based or plant-forward diet. You know, not, it's not feasible for everybody throughout the world to be 100% plant-based. We understand that, we know that, and it, you know, it may not, it may not be realistic for certain people, but definitely a plant-based and plant-forward. What does that mean? That most of your meal should be composed of things that come from nature, that grow from the ground or from a tree. So fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds. She says to fix our microbiome, we should not only eat a plant-forward diet rich in fiber, but also drink at least eight cups of water a day, get a minimum of seven to eight hours of restorative sleep every night, and at least 30 minutes of exercise five times a week. Exercise has definitely been shown to uh, be it incredibly beneficial for the gut, not only for the motility of the gut, its movement, um, you know, to have bowel movements, but also for the gut microbiome. So um, exercise has been shown to diversify the gut microbiome. What that means is that diversity equals a more resilient and robust microbiome more species doing the jobs that we need them to do. The next step is going out into nature. So nature has been shown to have not only beneficial um, effects on our mental health, but also on our body. And especially for the gut microbiome, when we're out in nature, some people like to call it nature bathing, um, we are actually grounding, like our um, parasympathetic nervous system, which is the opposite system as our fight or flight, our parasympathetic nervous system is in charge of rest and digestion. Um, so we're activating our parasympathetic nervous system through our vagus nerve. We're actually breathing in the microbiome of the natural environment we're in. That's actually making its way into our gut because we swallow air um, every day. She recommends at least two hours every week of nature bathing. These lifestyle medicine components are the same habits shared by those who live in the so-called blue zones, all right. Parts of the world where there are higher concentrations of centenarians or people reaching age 100 in good health. Places like Icaria, Greece, Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Italy, the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, and Loma Linda, California, the city in the United States where they live up to a decade longer than the rest of us. It's believed the reason for this is that there's a large Adventist community living there. They are vegetarians, exercise regularly, and they do not smoke or drink alcohol. A blue zone, and what does that mean? Places where people live 90 to 100 years without disabilities, because that's the important uh, caveat. We can live 90 years old on a hospital bed or hooked up to tubes or unable to do the things that we really thought we would like to do for the rest of our lives. But to be able to do that for 90, 100 years without disabilities. And the, 
these places have in common that they eat mostly plants, that they move all the time, so their life is based on going places on foot, repairing their fences and helping their neighbors, uh, walking to visit each other. It also means that they sleep well at night without pills, that they're not polluting their bodies with alcohol and cigarettes and drugs, and that they have low stress because guess what? When you are healthy, when you have your health, you don't have that many worries, which is one, one of the highest points of worry of Western countries is their health and health care. As evidence mounts that eating plant-based may allow us to age free from chronic disease, institutions like the Hayek Hospital in Lebanon have chosen to remove animal-based foods from their menus, becoming the first to offer only plant-based foods and breaking with the current business model of other medical centers. Many years ago, processed meats such as bacon, you know, turkey, deli slices, were put on the carcinogen list right next to, right next to cigarette smoking. Hospitals still serve that stuff in their cafeterias. How is that even possible? In our next episode, we hear what Dr. Negron thinks is behind that decision and see how some school districts are changing their cafeteria menus to include more plant-based options.